Hi everyone, just before we get this next history hack out and going, just a quick reminder that there are lots of ways you can support the pod. Remember just by liking, subscribing and sharing it with your friends, that is invaluable as it gets the word out and our witterings can go far and wide. But if you're able to support us financially, that would be incredible because it helps us keep doing what we're doing. In the description to this episode, there are links to Patreon where you can support the podcast regularly and ko-fi where you can tip us for an episode that you like but we've also got some merch so if you head to shop.historyhackpod.com you'll be able to see some incredible bits of merchandise featuring designs that steve smith does for every episode we've got some totes on there some mugs and we got more stuff coming all the time so please do check that out and if you are able to support us financially thank you so much But even if it's just liking, sharing, and telling everyone we're incredible, that helps us too. So, without further ado... Hello, and welcome to what is usually History Hack's dedicated Second World War aviation podcast, Pedge Hopping with me, Matt Bone. But today, we're going to be breaking the rules, because it's my show, and I can do whatever the hell I want, really. So, thanks for listening, and if you don't like that, you know, like, subscribe, and join us on Patreon. If you're still with us, though, we've got a fantastic guest because we have got Joe Coles with us, who many will know as the creator of Hushkit, the online aviation site, who's also got the Hushkit Book of Warplanes, Volume 1 in the works and now Volume 2 in the planning stages. And we're going to be having a bit of fun today. So, Joe, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I am good. Thank you. I've I've had a gin and tonic. I've had enough coffee. So, yeah, I'm exactly the right place now, I think. I'm feeling I missed out because I've made myself a cup of tea. (laughs) I'm a bit ahead of you. (laughs) I'll be good as it is still only Thursday and my local reopens tomorrow after many COVID delays. Oh, nice. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about underrated aircraft. We both come up with a list. So top fives. We'll get some honorable mentions in as well. But I think we're going to have an interesting debate because having been a follower and a supporter of the Warbirds Volume 1, I know we don't always agree on things. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. And we don't know what each other's lists are. So this could... Don't. I'm very curious. This, very... this could degenerate into something quite quite interesting. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's get going. We'll talk about the books at the end. We'll give a good plug then. But we will start with the airplanes. So, Joe, do you want to kick us off? What is your first great underrated military aircraft? I am going to start off with the Soviet MiG-25. Oh, okay. So this has kind of been, I would say most, the most overrated and the most underrated aircraft across its career. It's bounced around in perception and settled in a place which is quite undeserved, I would argue. So it's a very, very fast interceptor and reconnaissance aircraft. It's the project really gets going around 64 plans for a very very fast Mac 3 bomber the b-70 that didn't happen but uh, the soviets had responded to it built this amazing airplane which managed to go incredibly fast and the american intelligence analysts went crazy sort of projecting assuming it was incredibly agile assuming it was very fast assuming it was very advanced and it was great for them because they get loads of funding for everything but they were terrified then we have one defects to Japan with Viktor Belenko and they look at it and they think, oh, it's actually, it's a heap of shit. Oh, Hank, can I swear? Oh, you can do whatever you want, mate. Okay. Okay. So they, they, they think, oh, look, it's very, very primitive electronics in it. You know, it's, it's crudely made. It's, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a terrible machine. And so it went from being seen as this super fighter that transcended everything and sort of, you know, it was essentially started the F-15 program as response. So it went from being this super bogeyman into being largely written off as rubbish. And so there was this huge swing. But then if you look at its career, you see it really doesn't deserve to be written off. And I'll say a few things in this. So first of all, it gives you, if you use it for reconnaissance, it gives you a reconnaissance aircraft that's too fast for anyone to catch you but not like a Blackbird where you need a whole other infrastructure 
like air of fuel is dedicated to weird fuels and astronauts flying it and all sorts of stuff. This is just a very crude aeroplane that you can stick in Egypt or stick anywhere and it can do the thing and no one can catch it. Um, you can knock them out. They're cheap, relatively cheap to build. They haven't got titanium in. It's like, it's, you know, lots of steel in it and uh, more conventional materials. It's stainless steel, isn't it? It's, it's uh, oh God, I haven't got this to hand, but I think it's nickel steel and some stainless steel. And then you've got a, a very advanced kind of form of plexiglass for the canopy, but it's uh, titanium is considered too expensive to use. And also lots of the titanium in Russia was being siphoned off secretly by the CIA to use on the SR-71 as well. So you, 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 it gives you this cheap, invincible reconnaissance asset that's incredibly fast. You can go up to Mach 2.8 or 3.2 if you want to wreck the engines. It's also on the, used on the central front. It can carry tactical nukes. So it's going to be devastating there and, again, unstoppable. Its combat record is surprisingly impressive. Like, you look at its, the kills it scored in the Iran-Iraq war. It's got three F5s. It's got four Phantoms. It's got C-130. In, in other wars, it's got a Syrian MiG-21. It's one of the few, uh, or perhaps the only, Soviet aircraft to kill a team fighter. It killed an F-A-18. It damaged an F-15C. It pushed an EF-111 out of action. And there's a, a case where there were two MiG-25s uh, tried to engage F-15s, F-15Cs, the fighters. Uh, the F-15s managed to avoid being killed. And then another pair of F-15s joined the fight. Four of 15s chasing two fox bats. This is in, we're in Desert Storm now. The American aircraft fire 10 missiles. The fox bats get away. So all in all, I would say MiG-25 is kind of amazing and underrated. So that's why, those, those are some of my reasons why it's, uh, well, and also, you know, it's, it's a huge part of the backbone of the Soviet air defense during the, the most important years of the Cold War and continues in service in Syria and Egypt until very recently, possibly they might even have some kicking around in Libya now, I don't know, but they, a long service and a very impressive aircraft. So yeah, what do you think? Do you think it's fair for me to include the MiG-25? It, it is, because on my honorable mention list, I've got the 21. Ah, okay. You see, again, not as fast, of course, still very fast, very simple, but incredibly robust and, and amazing longevity, because it's still in service in, in places as well. And of course, we can't mention the 25 without the good old Avro Aero conspiracy theories that they lifted the designs and went off and, and did that. But we won't get into that. No, no, I think I think the 25 is a, it's a, it's a good shout because it is much maligned. But the fact that it's that it remained in it remains in service and does did as you said with did the F-15 stories are fantastic because it's there's I think there's in one of those desert storm documentaries that the BBC did back in the day, there was, you know, talk of all these prowess of American fighters just going in, shooting down everything that went before it. And then you hear these ones a little bit later. It gets a bit well, it, it even it was supposed to be very bad as a dogfighter. It's limited to 2.2 G nominally. But even, even then you hear accounts of it having maneuvering warfare with F-15s for quite a long time, a matter of, you know, quite a few minutes. So yeah, no, I certainly think it's very impressive. To go back briefly to your Avro Arrow reference, I, I of course think it's cobblers that <laughs> <laughs> these Soviets nicked the Arrow design. I can't see anything of the, the Arrow in the MiG-25 personally, but it was, it's interesting to put it into that historical context where quite a few countries looked at very fast, heavy interceptors and only the Soviets got them into service. Of course, the British had, had one on the go, the French had one, you know, these projects, the Canadians, the Americans, but it was only the Soviets that got round to putting something getting up into sort of the Mach 3 range and being massive. So that's kind of an interesting thing. That was a kind of late 50s fashion that was so expensive that nations tended not to pursue it. Yeah, that's, it's the, the fetishization of the technology. We have to go faster, we have to go faster, we have to go faster, you know, the... The, the the Valkyrie the Valkyrie bomber, which still is one of my favorites, the B seventy. You know, this this mad idea that bigger, faster, we need to be bigger and faster to be better, which then quickly starts falling apart post Vietnam with the redesign going back into high maneuverability aircraft and less fast, 
but can actually dogfight again. I think it's really, I think the 25 is a good show, actually. It's a good yeah. starting point. I think you're right with the speed. I think that the kind of the everything gets progressively faster until around about, well, somewhere between 1960 and 69, things stop getting faster. Uh, you know, if the Phantom's about the same top speed as a F-22 today, despite the time difference, and you're right, that the practicality of speed comes into it. But when high speed is negated, it, uh, neglected, rather, it does give the aircraft that are very, very fast an unfair advantage because no one else is doing it. So mm -hmm. MiG-25 can always leg it. And also, if it's firing missiles at incredibly high speed, incredibly high altitude, they're going to go a really long way, as Typhoons do to, today, which is another... Another advantage, very powerful radar. I could say loads more of why I think it's fabulous, but I think I'll leave it at that. So I think the MiG-25 is my first underrated aircraft. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking that. So I'm going to counter with my only jet on the list, actually. He says, quickly looking at his list. Yeah, it is my only jet on the list. Technically jet. And I'm, I'm, going, I'm going home. I'm going for the CF-100, the Canuck, which I'm going to argue is possibly the epitome of the all-weather interceptor. Because every nation in the 50s had this idea of this, this sort of transonic all-weather fighter that could meet Russian bombers coming at, at all times. And, you know, the, the British had the Javelin, which I have got a, a, an honourable mention in there for. But the, the CF-100 is true all-weather because it can operate in basically shitloads of snow, which very few very few fighters still still can today it was designed avro canada coming out of the war it's completely indigenous the engines are canadian the design's canadian it's made in toronto of all places it looks a bit strange because it looks like a cigar with two half smoking cigars splinted on the side and a couple you know very straight wings on either side but it's a design need that was a spec that was met very very well because you've got it's you know, subsonic, but it's still very fast, got really decent range, which is what you need for Canada, can operate in all weathers. And then the, especially the, the later version of the Mark IV, I think it had, had su superb, superb radars and fire control systems that allowed it to see a very long way, despite the fact that it, it never actually had any guided missiles on it, despite the, the plans for Sparrows to be on it quite, quite late on. But for what it needed to be, to intercept what they were expecting to be coming at it in the in the 50s and the late 50s. You've got 850 calibers on it. You've got a f decent radar and everybody's favorite, you know, big packs of unguided rockets just to fire into bomber streams. So it's combat thinking is still very much Second World War, but what you actually have is a quite forward thinking aircraft that's going to, you know, go up against a threat that is very quickly dissipating as ballistic missiles are, are coming in and the speeds of, of, of aircraft suddenly jump um, past it. But, you know, it stayed in Canadian service for 30 years. And, you know, I remember being on a, chatting to a couple old Canadian Air Force pilots and they used to fly them out of Cold Lake and go buzzing their friends who'd be having barbecues and be blowing their mates off the roofs of their cottages and things like that with the jet wash on them and things. Because they could say you could do anything with it at any level. You know, designed to get up to get up to altitude and cruise for as long as possible, but they, they would beat stuff up down on the ground at a great rate of knots anyway. I, 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 I'm picturing that now and I, I, I'm imagining it's got a relatively low wing loading. There's a yeah. great big wing on it, isn't there? So yeah, great big wing with the big tanks on the, um, on the wing tips as well for, for so range sort of, on the It's loading. almost like a kind of fighter Canberra. Mm, yeah. Somewhere, I guess. So it's, it's very kind of sensible design. And like I said, it's also, it's coming in at an, in, an interesting time because you've got the older sort of World War II idea of the day fighter and the night fighter. And then this kind of move in the fifties, there's a kind of merging of these ideas, isn't there? And it's in that kind of period where it's moving towards the time where most fighters are all, all weather fighters or most fighters are what would be, would, would have been called a night fighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very much so. And I think it's, it's a uniquely Canadian thing, which is why I've always had a bit of a soft spot for it. And, you know, while it's, well, it's in service and it's getting there. It's completely overshadowed by the, the insanity of the era, which is what everybody was expecting for you know, a, a 50s, a 50s fighter is this, this big, big, fast, bur burly thing that was, you know, science fictiony. But in reality, what the RCAF needed and, and had for a long time was this very sturdy, very 
decent. And they weren't exported, were they? I don't think, were they? Yeah. And it's, it's presumably is that is that to do with US export limitations, <laughs> or just because they were kind of specialized and expensive, and you could buy American stuff cheaper? Yeah, ba- ba- basically, the same time you've got you know North Americans selling the F eighty six to everybody, including Canada, and Canada are making making the um, their version of it as well. Better, isn't it? The Canadian version is. Mm, yeah, is um, I think the ones, some of the ones that are still flying are actually the the Canada ones, the whatever yeah, the, the British are. ones. Can- do I remember the British ones, Canadian or American? I know they came from America, but were they? Anyway, I'm not sure about it. To edit that out, I'm, I think, not, sure. I think I'm not sure. About that. Digressions we like. I, th- I think the later ones were Canadian, actually. I have, we'll have to check. They, they were really good, the Canadian ones, weren't they? Or the Australian ones were good as well. So it was, it was just, you know, as as they got them and, and started reverse engineering them, they just were making all the changes that North America never got around because they'd moved on to the, the 100 series. I think that's totally fair. I, I can't... I'm, I really wanted to disagree with that one, but I, I can't. I think give give me fair. a minute. I'll give you plenty to disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> too, re- too reasonable so far. No, that's hard, hard to argue with. Now, do you want, I can go modern or old now. What, what would you fancy? You lead the way. I shall, I, shall, I shall counter as best I can. i got a good one coming up in a minute. Okay. Well, I'm going to go with the Bolton Pool Defiant. Oh, controversial. Okay. So that's kind of got a bad reputation. It's uh, it's a fighter with a, its armament in a turret, a trainable turret on the top, and it has to carry around the weight of that turret around with it. So it had quite a bad reputation. It had quite high losses, and you know, generally it's considered a bit of a, a terrible aeroplane. But there's a, there's a few things I want to say in its its defence, really. And one is that it was used in a way that wasn't intended. So it was designed to operate against unescorted bombers. And if they'd all all the defiance had been based in Scotland or the north of England, they could have done that and then freed up some Spitfire and Hurricane fighters in the south, and it would have done a decent job. And there were there were sort of two units that had sort of varying tactics. Like the I think, I'm trying to remember what they are. I think it's two six four squadron, and I've got notes somewhere. And one one four. Anyway, one of the, I think two six four actually had far better tactics and tended to use more kind of shrag music, you know, the kind of a German approach of going underneath something and firing up into a vulnerable position mm-hmm. at the bottom. When you did that with the Defiant, you could get pretty decent results. So I don't think it was a terror. I'm going to keep this short, this one, but I don't think it's a terrible design. I just think it was being asked to do things it wasn't designed to do. And uh, it could have been a useful Scottish defender. And if I knew enough about football, I could name a Scottish defender, but I, I can't. <laughs> And annoy, annoyingly, I can't really argue with you there. I think, I, like, what was what was the other one? The Hotspur, the the Hawker turret fighter as well. The, the, there was this. It was designed for the wrong war, wasn't it? it? This this idea that you'd suddenly have German bombers camped on the Channel coast never crossed anyone's mind. It was this ex- expectation of um, aircraft coming a long way. Yeah. And then you having you having the time to to send things up again, and you wouldn't have to worry about fighters. Unfortunately for the Defiant, that war never really materialized, um, or it was never materialized in the south of England, as, as you say. Yeah, yeah, and I I think, I mean, to be harsh on the Defiant, you you could say that it you know in the end it has to deal with reality, and it couldn't deal with reality terribly well, but. I think it's it gets a lot of shit that isn't entirely fair. And like I say, if it was if it was doing the role it was intended to do, and if it was put into places in further in the north uh, and using more appropriate ta- ta- tactics, I think it would be more favourably remembered. And I, I don't think anyone could be accused of it being overrated anyway. So yeah, it's it's my underdog choice, the Defiant. I think it's kind of cute looking as well. So. It is a cool looking plane. I, I I did build a number of of models of them back in the back in the day when I I built models because they just are fun fun to put together. Yeah, you, you sort of, you sort of wonder maybe that you know it did get the, the the better Merlins later on and things like that, but it was stuck with Merlin one for a long time, wasn't it? So it was didn't have great power. Same as the the battle and well, and and also it, when it gets radar, it's pretty good night fighter mm. it's just the 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 Luftwaffe bombing rates kind of wrapping up then but as a night fighter pretty decent because mm. it, it's you know it's it's got that 
that ability as a night fighter to position the aircraft in the right place. The, the pilot just has to get it into the right spot and let the, the, the gunner do his thing. I think that's that's okay. The last book that came out about it took a took a bit of flack, and there's another one coming, which does, apparently takes a bit more even view. So it's going to be interesting to see how popular opinion takes the defining. It's an easy RAF aircraft to give a good kicking to in it when you're in, a, in the usual pub debates about it. Um, well, having said it's underrated, I mean, if I had a choice of having that or Spitfires defending me, <laughs> like, I'm not crazy. I will, I will go with the Spitfires. But I still think, yeah, I, I want to include it. I want to give it a chance. I think that's that's fair. You, you've, you've made a, a good shout for it. Yeah, no, it's, I think that's, that's fine. I can just see the responses to this one when people get this far into the podcast, because the Defiant is a very Marmite aircraft. You either have a soft spot for it or you don't. All right, so as, as, we've, as we've delved into World War II, just if anyone is playing um, History Hack Bingo, the Typhoon will not be making a, an entry on my list. So if you're looking forward to that, you can, you can stop listening. It won't, it won't be meant, I, I won't be mentioning it either. No. No. Because I don't think it was underrated. See, there, there we go. Anyways, that's by the by. Let's see the next issue of Airplane for more. I've got two Second World War ones, but as we've done sort of fighter, I'm going to go fighter, which okay. is my only Russian on the list. Okay. Because I've gone Yak-3. Okay. Interesting. Not, okay. Yeah, I, I already I, have some questions, but I let, I'll, I'll hold back. I have a lot of time for it. I, I, like, I like that it's sort of being developed in that sort of wonderful Yakla style where there's just loads of them coming all at the same time, all with numbers that are just sort of picked out of a hat. The the one, the three, the five, the, yeah, they're, they're all doing in, in crazy. Any, in any order, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just seems which, whichever one reaches the front of the development queue is the one that <laughs> goes out the door. But it's it's a very tidy design. It's got decent uh, decent armament on it. Again, that wonderful Russian almost make, do and mend approach of bits of it being plywood. It's an aircraft that would never have been made in the West in the way that it was, especially in the time period it was. You're looking at 43, 44 entry into service, but it's very tidy. Decent-ish engine was the come off 107, which is slightly underpowered for it. But again, it's ve- it's it's a very light airframe, so it can it can take it and it can do the dance with the sort of later 109s quite comparably. 190s, you probably don't want to get too much into a scrap with it, but it does stand up very well against what is being thrown at it. Granted, it's going to be in you know, fairly decent numbers by this point as well. But you sort of read the read people who've flown them, even now with the, the, the rebuild ones, they say it's a very, very tidy aircraft. You've probably got more, more smoother power and, and torque in the, the Allison ones that are up now as opposed to the, um, the old come-off ones. But I think... We talk a lot on the Eastern Front. I know you, you're a big champion of the IL-2 being this, this incredible aircraft, but around it were a lot, a lot of these, some of the big ones as well, which I've never been too much of a fan of. But the fact that it, it got hundreds of victories for, you know, small, for, for small losses. I've, I have, I've just opened up one page. Where is it? 273 air victories, the French, or 99 of the French victories for that weird French group that was flying with the Soviets. And, then, it's, and am I right in thinking they, there was one pilot from, from that group that they spoke to and said he favoured it to the Western alternatives? Yes. The choice, he would go with that over a Spitfire or, or other yeah. Western aircraft. He, he, he was very left wing though. So it's, I think it would be an on brand comment for him, if I remember correctly, with that guy's politics. But I, I've, I've got a lot of time. For, I also think it looks really cool. I think it's just yeah. got some lovely lines on it. Even the radio version's got, it looks it looks chunky. So yeah, I I think of the Russian fighters of the Second World War, the th- Yak three is probably my my favorite, and the one that doesn't really get talked about. So I think that one's underrated. Does does the job? Mass produced, typical sort of Russian Russian sensibilities about it. And no, I, I, well, okay, I can't argue with that. The aircraft I think is very good in lots of ways, but I am going to um, pick up one thing I think, which is. I'm not sure how underrated it is in Russia. I wonder mm-hmm. if it's more in the in the West that it's underrated. And, and um, I'll speak to some Russian friends afterwards and find out. But my hunch is that it is quite widely respected in Russia. So it might be more of a kind of bias, sort of nationalist bias over here. 
that we we don't think about it too much because I think it probably is. Well, I guess like you say, there's uh, you know Lavochkins and Migs and other things going on, but I would be interested in the Russian perspective. But I can't argue with you that I think it's tremendously useful, impressive, impressive little aircraft, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I think this what what you're saying spot on. I think this is our blind spot, not looking wider and, and you know we were saying beforehand that underrated in these sort of contexts doesn't necessarily mean unknown whereas i think for for us we we tend to be a little bit maybe a little bit dismissive of of the russian kit you know i think the the il2s had some rehabilitations i think the games helped it a lot <laughs> yeah but the, the the other russian aircraft i don't think tend to get especially in the in the west when we have our Mustang and Spitfire blind spots that we, we consider you know, these, you know, these very tidy Russian designs, which when you start pulling them apart, you think, well, hang on, here's an aircraft that's mostly plywood as well out of, out of necessity, as opposed to, to anything else. I, I, I would love, so I'd love of- to hear what your, your Russian friends have to say about, I think it's in the context of, of me sitting here who spends far too much time looking at the ETO. I think that's, those, those are really good points. And, and also from memory, some of the Soviet fighters are tiny as well, aren't they? Like they're, mm. they're, some of them are smaller than 109s and able to meet them on equal terms. So uh, yeah, no, good, good, good call on that. Like I say, my only challenge would be, is it underrated everywhere? Mm. Only no, it's just fair, fair, fair shot, fair shot. I, I've just got a picture of it up here now and it, I'm just like, yeah, like that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's cool. It looks a little bit British in some ways, I think. Mm. It's quite super marine isn't it? Especially, especially around the engine cowling. I, yeah, I've got time for it. I've got a lot of time. I, to, yeah, I think it's a, and like you say, people who, who, who fly them say they're wonderful, don't they? Absolutely mm. responsive and wonderful. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. plywood ailerons as, as, as well. You just think, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, that's a good name for rock band as well, isn't it? And yes. Right, what have you got for us next? I've got... Uh, right, do you want me to go World War Two or 80s? What are you feeling like now? Let's go 80s. Let's, let's bounce okay. around a bit. Let's keep people on their toes. Okay, so I'm going to go Panavia Tornado F Mark III. Ooh, okay. So kind of like the MiG-25, this one bounces around a bit in public perception. Britain wanted to build an uh, interceptor version of the Tornado but they were slightly dishonest to the other partners, Italy and Germany, about how much work that would be. Because for, for sort of funding and work share reasons, they had to fib a bit. And it was actually quite different <laughs> to, the, to the IDS, to the bomber version. And it came out a little bit after the bomber version. It quickly, there was a load of problems. It had the wrong engines. It had bomber engines optimized for low level flight. And so it really struggled at higher altitude. It didn't have enough thrust. The radar didn't work. It, w- it wasn't anywhere near as agile as F-15s and then Su-27s were emerging. Uh, and it just seemed like a bit of a, bit of a joke, but we, we didn't know that at the time because the British press were generally raving about it. Like British books were talking about this super fighter with this amazing radar and combat performance that could out scissor a hunter and all these kind of things. And we were kind of not really, there was lots of propaganda and it was only later on that it came out, you know, how, how problematic it was. And also, especially the radar, we hadn't really done a radar since a proper fighter radar for a REF type since the lightnings AI 23, a long time ago. So the, the, the skill set wasn't there, the technology wasn't there. You know, there was some Harrier stuff, but we'll see Harrier stuff, we'll put that, ping that aside. So the radar was too ambitious and I'm not really selling it so far, am I? But let me get to, let me get to the good stuff, which is they really polished the turd. Like by the time it got to stage three upgrades, just before it got retired, it had C5 AMRAM. So this very advanced fire and forget, excellent, best in the world missile. For shorter range, the ASRAM, again, one of the very best infrared short range missiles, almost impossible to to confuse with flares, you know, immensely fast, hugely powerful rocket motor. So great weapons, automatic track well scan on the Fox Hunter, 
JTIDS data link, secure radio, brilliant identification, friend or foe, toad radar decoy, better situational awareness than almost anything, well, probably even better than the Americans at the time. So by the time it retires, it's brilliant. And I was speaking to someone who was involved in assessing it, and he said, like, the end of its life, F-16s couldn't get anywhere near it. They'd just be zapped out of the way. They'd, they'd never get into a merge with with the F-3. It was just too good at BVR, beyond, beyond visual range combat. So, yeah, it's got a lot of criticism, but for that, I'm going to put the F-3 tornado in. Mm. No, I think... You see, this 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 is where sort of my age and my upbringing sort of jaded jades me a little little bit. Is you know I, I moved over here in early nineties from Canada, and you sort of grow up with, as you do in Canada, bombarded with American aircraft, and there's always the tornado over here that you know, the Tonkaites basically doing what you just did, and it's yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things that I think is thoroughly British in that it comes good in the end. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, <laughs> you know, the idea is not too bad. The initial application of it leaves a little bit to be desired, but through pluck and determination, by the time it's you know it's retired and replaced by something else that's <laughs> going to take us ten years to get right, like the the typhoon did. Yeah, you know, it's 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 pretty damn good. I think yeah, I think that's again that's uh, annoyingly that's a good show. I can't really. Well, I, I, I realize there's there's some things I didn't mention, which is also. It's got fabulous range, you know. It's mm. the, the Typhoon can't compete with the Typhoon, the aircraft that re replaced it for the fighter interception role in the RAF can't compete for range. And it's also a low level. It's one of the possibly the fastest aircraft in the world. You know, there's, there's probably a flanker might be able to give it a drag race, but something crazy like 920 miles an hour. At, sea level something absolutely bananas so it had a lot going for it even though it was had the wrong engines so i think it was a successfully polished herd that and by the end it was very good this was replacing the phantom wasn't it the, the f3 was yeah 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 and well the, the, there were still phantoms and lightnings kicking around when it was it was coming in all tornadoes sound fantastic especially at low level when you're up in the lakes or something in in, in the good old days and they'd go blasting past and yeah there's something special about it. Yeah, no, that's 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 good. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have that one. As and, also, and also, look, as great as Typhoon is, it's plastic, and up close, it doesn't look too good. And I was at, I was at RF Lucas. For, I think it might have been a tornado farewell. I can't remember where I was there, but there was a. We went inside a darkened hangar, and there was the black-tailed F3 in there, mm. an out flight line with Typhoons that looked really plasticky up close. But in this dark hangar was this hugely tall, beefy machine with this big black tail and look the fucking business so yeah that for that reason as well yeah it, it's got all the toys on it you want it you want as a kid as well isn't it it's got you know yeah very very variable wing it's it's got big slabs and things you'd sort of look at it today and go well oh, it's not not very stealthy but yeah just you know, light the burners and get out of the way thank you very much yeah it's astonishingly unstealthy i think with that that tail and that boxy boxy fuselage yeah no i like that i'm gonna counter with something strange now Okay, and this this one of my list was my th th this was my MiG twenty one. Do I include that or do I include this one? Because I'm, I'm going to go this one because it's very well known. People will probably arg argue this to cows come home, but I'm actually going to throw in for a great underrated aircraft C one thirty Hercules. You're a madman. I am, and I'm going to give you the reasoning <laughs> behind it. And this is not just because I'm thinking of emailing Seb Davy about something and I want to be on his good books. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of these aircraft that is amazing, has done everything, but we just don't, we don't consider it in the great scheme of the great scheme of everything. And I want to, I want to give it some love because for something that's been around since well, it's late, you know, late fifties, early sixties, if you think of a hotspot, a humanitarian crises, a madcap special forces op, there will be a Hercules involved in it, being driven by some madman at you know, great, great rate of knots at zero feet as well. And it's incredible. And the reason I'm going underrated is because of the usual standard that people don't think about logistics. 
you know, in, in the same way that the Dakota or, or things like that aren't really considered in the great scheme of, of things when it comes to the Second World War. I think the Herc, okay. the Herc is 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 omnipresent. You know, it's still going now. Speak to anyone who flies the A400M and they want their Hercules uh, back. So I hear you on the, the pointy stuff gets, you know, they're the poster boys, they get the most press. But I cannot give you underrated than the Hercules. Absolutely. It's the most <laughs> loved, respected machine, like universally praised, universally loved. Everyone's bought them. I, I can't give you that one. I'm sorry. That's, that's <laughs> absolutely bananas to say the Hercules is underrated. I've never heard anyone say anything bad about it ever. Well, yes. And that's why I said this is the one that was probably going to cause me some troubles. But it's, again, you know, we were saying underrated is probably not unknown, but when you think <coughs> of applications of it, you know, it's not the thing that's going to come come to the top of everybody's list. And I wanted to throw it in to, 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 to start an argument, really. Well, um, I, I think it's good to include, I think I've just done like, you know, fightery, bombery things. And I think it's really good to include transports. But I just I just think that's an indefensible position. I, 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 I will fight you on that. I, I, I don't think it's fair to say it's underrated. <laughs> Cannot give you that. <laughs> in fact, I might force you to say another one in place. Okay. Of well, I, I do have I do have a fighter up my sleeve that I can replace with, okay. and not and not that fighter before we get on to it. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it I, gonna- yeah. It it was to be fair I, on my list. I've got a little asterisk next next to it to just sort of think: Do I really want to do this? And I I just have, and I'm I'm gonna. I'm going to stand on this hill. I may not die on it, but I'll fight for a little while. I was I was asking friends, some aviation writers, for ideas for this this show today. You know of what of what I could include, and someone suggested the Spitfire. Oh dear! And I said, like, what? What? What's what's that? It was it was it was the writer Paul Eden, who's a very a very good aviation writer. But his his point was that for a lot of British people they forget the story after the Battle of Britain and it did so much afterwards. And he said the Spitfire story really starts after the Battle of Britain and its work after that is overlooked. But I'm not accepting that either. <laughs> so, no. Like, See, I, I, have, I have a theory that the greatest Spitfire is the Mark II. Because no Mark II, you don't get it engined up to a Mark V. No Mark II, you don't get engined up again to a Mark IX. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So, yeah, the, the the five and the nine, which are great mm-hmm. in their times, nine probably greatest of all. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they're not that much different to the original two, with just a whacking great engine on it and a slightly different different tail. We won't get into the wings because the wings annoy me on okay. Spitfire. Interesting. Are you, you, you'd go more Merlin than Griffin. Okay, I'm going to, this is going to upset people. I think for what was done with them, the Merlin Spitfires, but I prefer the sound of a griffin. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know that's sacrilegious. Paul Beaver and I have had this debate for a long time, but I think, <laughs> I think he's on my side with this. I think the griffin sounds better. There's just something, wow. something, something about it. Is it tuned to a major key? Hmm. Griffin. There's, yeah. That's interesting. Very, Okay. Hmm. I do like those brutal uh, late Griffin ones in the twenties. I love. I really like those monstrous things. Yeah, I, I think my favourite Spitfire. I don't know where we're going off. Is the is the PR nineteen? Oh yeah. yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah. The, just the lines on it. I think everything on it is just the right proportions. It, it looks great because you know the, the Griffin's got the slightly longer nose, and it, I think it just evens it all out a little bit. And you know what? What is how the Spitfire could get on the underrated is Rocky Spitfires, which mm. are amazing and are like cutting edge, incredible research and technology going in, and they don't necessarily get all the credit they should, and they were brilliant. Mm. So maybe we could even squeeze an honourable mention of, a, of Spitfires in from a Rocky. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm I'm hoping that hoping to drag Tony Hoskins in to talk about his his uh, AA 810 that he's working on at the moment because we were in, had a beer and we geeked out about PR Spitfires for far too long. So it's there's a conversation that needs to be had. Yeah, no, please do. They're, they're amazing things. I think there's a, you could you could make an argument for Spit, Spitfire being underrated. I think 
personally, I think it was misused in a lot of applications, especially when you think of like the, the LF-9 as a fighter bomber, not great range, not great bomb load, but there's lots of them. So it kind of evens out a bit. Anyways, we, we, we digress. But I think that... Subject, but yeah, it's. Uh, I think saying the Spitfire is underrated is for the most... Well, it must be up there with the most deified airplanes, mustn't it? You could probably pick a specific mark and argue that that, yeah, maybe say a 14 or something like that. But no, not having it. Seafires. Maybe you could argue seafires. Ooh. They went to the crap. No, no, no. <laughs> they're only, it's, it's, sorry, they're, they're good when they're flying. When they're in the air, they're great. Yeah, it's just getting them up and down. That's a yeah. bit, of, bit of a problem. Okay, so there we go. That, that was my contentious, contentious one, which has been shot down. Uh, quite rightly, I'll give you that. I <laughs> Sorry for being mean. <laughs> oh no, no, I. It, it it was one of those ones. I was thinking, yes, I don't. Let's do it. Right. What have you got next for us? I've got the Messerschmitt BF one ten. Oh, okay. Yes. So that's got quite a bad reputation. It gets mauled in the Battle of Britain. It's a twin engined heavy fighter, a destroyer, and it's it's obviously it's a German thing. Comes starts it's. Starts in about 1936, where it flies, and it's good range, very fast, decently agile for its type, but it goes up against single engine fighters and no twin can, even the best twins will struggle against a single and will always be at a disadvantage. And I think we, certainly from the British perspective, are very harsh on the 110 while turning a blind eye to how some of our twins did when faced with a single engine fighter opponent. So I, th I think it was kind of, it's used, again, used in a slightly unexpected way. It's having to go up, you know, go up against fierce op opposition than intended. And then when you use it, right, when you use it for interdiction or strike or as an intruder or as a night fighter, it's pretty decent. Mm. And it, you know, when you stick radars in there, and I think it even pioneered an infrared sensor and had crazy armament in it, going up to what, 37 mil or possibly even more. Very versatile, uh, very decent for what it was, and unfairly criticized, I would say. I think that's a really good show, actually. I've got a lot of time for the 110. Um, I, I can't argue with you there, really. And sensible longevity as well especially when it moves into the night fighter role as well it's able to be adapted to that very quickly and very effective and i think that's that's quite something the less said about its successes the better mm. probably yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, it doesn't necessarily go so well some of the developments no but yeah i think that's exactly it. we we tend to i guess we tend to think about it in that battle of britain context don't we that yeah Oh, it was this this great heavy heavy fighter that then had to be escorted by by single engine one hundred nine. Yeah, and again, and again, that's a miss a misreading of the of the sort of standard tactics with top cover and stuff, isn't it? So yeah. even that isn't fair. So again, I put that in the underrated. Well, you know, in in one of the aspects of why it's under underrated. Yeah, and I think it's it's not thinking in the direct sort of top trumpsy comparison between aircraft what it's supposed to do versus what it was kind of used for in a lot of those even other. even in the top trumpsy kind of realm you've got a pretty good speed you have some engine issues and a re-engining in the development stage which loses it some the early versions very very fast before the, the engine change what was it like 315 miles an hour and then it gets very fast towards the end so it's, it's i think it's a very decent airplane that was and a lot was asked for it which was it was struggling to do, but I'd say very decent, decent design. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm mildly annoyed. I didn't think of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Again, also, I think it looks really nice. Yeah. Kind of, kind of sleek, isn't it? Not mm. as good looking as a, as a whirlwind. I, I, I would no, say. I, 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 I do. I do like a whirlwind as well. That did. I was thinking of an honorable mention for that, but I think for what it, the whirlwind that is what it is and what it was, it kind of, kind of was really i think if it could have had could have been re-engineered with merlins i think it would have been that story is fascinating what if i think it would it, the potential was there it was a a prototype 
supercar really wasn't it it was, mm. it was never refined but the potential was there the very very sensible design huge firepower loads of speed loads of great stuff there great you know great visibility from the canopy but it did it they were busy with other things and they were busy with the merlin yeah okay i'm gonna again i'm going hercules adjacent for my next oh one. my god okay because right. <laughs> I felt I had to go. I've, this this is another one I, I was on the bubble a bit, but I've gone for the B twenty five. Okay, because it's omnipresent everywhere. It does just about everything, but it's in in the in the grand story of that we tell of, of the war. It, it's it's never mentioned. It's the heavy strategic stuff, or we get straight to you know in, in that sort of medium bit all the conversation, all the oxygen gets sucked up by the mosquito on the allied side, but you've got North American, you know, cash cow, really <laughs> this, this fantastic bomber that from where it enters, most people's imagination is the, you know, the, the, the do little raid. And then it probably seeps out of people's memory until they pick up catch 22. And that's probably about it. But when you start considering the, a, the numbers of them, loads of them, the tactical application of them in Italy and Europe, especially for going after transport targets and, you know, especially in the two TAF world, quite considerable quick reaction as well when you need a little bit more oomph than a, you know, a straight package of, of, of fighter bombers can do. It is an incredible aircraft that I don't think we, we give enough credit to because it's, it's that thing that sort of sits in the middle, doesn't it? You, you know, you get the sex, the sexy fighter bombers, P 47s typhoons do, doing their thing, getting all, all the praise. And then up above it, you've got the heavies bludgeoning their way deep into Germany and, and getting, getting all the movies. And then in the middle, you've got this incredibly robust, decent bomb load. It was about three, 3000 pounds, good crew, good defensive armament. Yeah. You know, Crazy, crazy study. See the pictures of some of them coming back with most of them shot away. And if they get remembered, it's because you've got Yasarian trying desperately not to get in one ever again. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. Or, you know, we get some terrible Beautiful. Pearl Harbor movie where you actually get to see a few of them taking off from Hornet. But I just, I just think it's, it's underrated in that it's probably not in the right circles, but again, maybe like, like the, we just don't talk about it enough in in relation to what it was. I was doing some research on on the radar thing I'm, I'm working on, and when you start looking at what two TAF was doing day to day, you get you know, fighter bomber, fighter bomber, Mitchell, Mitchell, Mitchell. Mitchell. <laughs> you just like, well, hang on a second. L late forty three onwards, the amount of operations they're flying from places like Dunsfold as well, which was just packed with them. Is is remarkable. I, I I really like it. I think we should we should talk about it more. I need to do I need to do a whole show about it. Certainly, like a, a very very versatile, capable aircraft. I mean, I think I I, I maybe would say um, underexposed rather than underrated. Okay. Uh, I think, and I think that might be because it kind of looks okay, flies okay, does everything okay. It's kind of it's a, a, a quiet sibling, isn't it? That kind of gets mm -hmm. over overlooked. Maybe that's but it's hugely important and a very, you know, yeah. Like you say, very capable. Yeah. It's not, not as sexy looking as the Marauder, but it, I it think if it looked a bit sexier, it, it would get talked about a lot more. Yeah. And if it had some mad flaws that were later rectified. Yeah. That's, that's, that always makes a good story. It, it's, it's, it's damning feature was that it was, it was pretty good when it started. And it was pretty good when it finished. And yeah, it's a cheese sandwich of a plane. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I thought I was going to get more flag for that one, but no, cool. Oh, okay. Right. I think that is that for each now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I've saved, I've saved my oldest one for last, but let's, let's go you. What, what have you got for us? What have I got? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what I've got. I know what I've got. I, thought we uh, have neglected helicopters. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, I didn't quite narrow it down. So I've got three options and I'll let you pick, but I'll try and run through them. Okay, go for it. So first of all, uh, the Mill My4 Hind. It's, you know, designed as a response to the H19, 
but uh, and they, they're used in Korea. But the Hound is considerably bigger. It can lift a lot more. It up to 16 passengers, 16,000 kilograms of internal cargo, clamshell rear loading doors, under fuselage gondola for a machine gunner, uh, 4,000 built. That's double the whirlwind and the Chickasaw combined. Kind of very important in a certain in story of Bangladesh. Uh, notably used by the Indian Army during the Bangladesh Liberation War. It used it moved the 57th Mountain Division across the Meghna River after the bridges were blown up or occupied, allowing them to close in on Dhaka. And they did lifted a battalion of troops during the, ba- the Battle of Silhet, which was Indian Army's first heliborne operation. But as such, it played a vital part in the liberation of Bangladesh from West Pakistan. So it's it's a helicopter that's hugely important for the creation of a nation. So I think it's worth mentioning for that. Also 4,000 built, really good, and often kind of just written off as a, as a carbon copy of a Western type, which is unfair. It's, a big, it's bigger and better. So that would be my first telling. Do you want me to go through the others first or do you want to give me your opinion on that now? I'm, 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 I'm liking it. I'm going to let you go through and then we'll, we'll, we'll do a roundup. Well, then the CH-37, how do you pronounce it? I never know how you pronounce it. Is it Mojave? Mojave, yeah. Mojave is, isn't it? First of all, like two Corsair engines. Brilliant. Piston engines. <laughs> double wasps. Double, double wasps. Brilliant. Just for the sort of class of having those engines. Uh, <laughs> the largest helicopter outside the Soviet Union at the time. Sikorsky's first twin. And so as it stuck the engines out on pods, which was kind of a new idea then, it freed the fuselage up, 26 troops, three lightweight Jeeps. And in Vietnam, it recovered like $8 million worth of aircrafts over a two-year period. It could collect other helicopters, space capsules, film capsules from reconnaissance satellites. So hugely historically important. Piston engine again, brilliant, love that. And uh, it was forced into early retirement because the turbines were coming in. And it may be the only helicopter in the world that's displayed in the desert with which it shares a name. So mm. yeah, I would say that's one. And another one, which I was recently, I did an article on the Hushkit site about the top 10 Cold War aircraft. And I was trying to consider what helicopter to include and what came close to getting mentioned. It wasn't really top 10, but it was up there somewhere was the Westland Whirlwind. Uh, this is the other Westland Whirlwind, the helicopter. Yep. So the engine's position at the front of the aircraft allowed the cockpit to be raised above the cabin, creating a large cargo area, and it avoided all the center of gravity issues that the early helicopters had. Search and rescue, anti-submarine warfare, on a good deck, carry 10 troops. But it was also, it was more how it was used that's important. It pioneered airborne assault. It's the, it's the first airborne assault by helicopter, uh, and it carries on for ages. Is even gets turbines in the end, soldiers on into the early 80s, which is kind of terrifying. So though one of those helicopters, now I'll, I'll, I'll let you choose out of those because I couldn't, it was too painful to choose one. So that has to be your, your call on that. Okay, I do have a soft spot for the world. I, I, I love it. It's, it's the sort of helicopter you'd make out of Lego if, if you're making a helicopter. Which one, sorry? The, the Whirlwind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, or, if, or if you were to say to a kid, draw me a helicopter, that's kind of probably what would come out but i think i think you've probably got a good shout on the hind uh, to the, the hound even it's you know i last saw one when i was in siberia actually what were you doing what were you doing there have you been i was working with ut air so the massive airline out there that basically whenever you see sort of russian un helicopters doing relief work they tend to be from this this airline and we're putting a computer system in and there was all kinds of cool stuff out there in Tumen. great times very messy though um booze wise vodka yeah. wise <laughs> boo, 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 booze wise yeah it's uh yeah everybody had their own vodka and you had to try it all but yeah i think you hit on the head really that four thousand examples of it built you know but i think i think it's a good shout i think it's i think that's probably out of the three mainly because Despite all your championing of, you know, the Sikorsky, it just looks terrible. I, I think it looks brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> just the, the engines alone. Like you look at what other aircraft have had that. You, you probably, off the top of your head, the other aircraft have had those engines. And it's just a list of 
uh, the coolest aeroplanes and then you stick those two monstrous radials into a helicopter imagine what that thing sounds like love it absolutely it, great let, let's let's not let's not be around the bush the, the r2800 is one of the greatest engines ever made sounds incredible power yeah. incredible incredible things I'm sorry, but both it looks like they forgot to add engines when they were designing it and just slapped two of these things on it, either side. No, it looks like the king of the dinosaurs. <laughs> like the highest ranking dinosaur. I, 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 yeah, I think it looks cool. Really cool. Yeah. Oh, I would actually, there's a couple of honorable mentions I quickly want to squeeze in so I don't forget. And one is the, the Aerocobra. Yeah. The mid engine mounted American fighter uh, and just for how successful it was in the great patriotic war with the Soviet Union and how it's the fate, you know, it's the favored Western fighter and how it was really good and has kind of a bad rep, a uh, bad reputation, but it did great there. And the other would be the P40, which again has a kind of reputation of being Mr. Mediocre, but generally historically it always wins whenever it goes anywhere, even yeah. against the K84, which should have, kicked its ass but the p40 again was like a cheese sandwich wasn't it really mm. like the mitchell but i think those those deserve a mention as well no that's 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 a strong strong show i i i love reading about the dara cobra it's it's like it's a formula one designer trying to put those those ideas into a plane isn't it it's let's put, put the engine in the middle because then that means we can have a whacking great cannon up the front yeah all the logic is there, and yet for some reason, it is it poorly applied, you know, by by the Allies, especially especially in the desert. Yeah, you know, it it's interesting because then when it's used for that specific, you know, the role it was intended for by by the Russians, it is it is very good. But I, and, and I guess, and you can also wonder if if the if the Germans don't quite figure it out because it it's a bit different. You know, it's I'm sure there's that, and I think there's also the the deal of everything is low level in warfare over there as well. So I think that's got to could be a meaningful again it's another alice in 1710 isn't it so it's it's great huh? no i think i think that's that's good so what's I've, what's your what's i'm very curious about your last one okay we're going right back to the beginning for this one and we're going bristol scout ah okay nice so i I've, i'm fascinated by this this thing and to make sure I got this right, I've gone to the, the font of all knowledge on this, Matt Willis. <laughs> you get him started on the Bristol Scout and he's, he's, he's away. When you start looking into the First World War, it's like the Second World War. You're dominated by the big, the big types and the, the story that, you know, there was nothing decent along until the Sopwith pup comes along and then that's, that saves everything. But then the Germans come back and there's the you know, bloody, eight, whatever. In the middle of it, you have Bristol basically cracking what needs to be in a scout aircraft by 1916 it's highly maneuverable it's got ailerons on both wings so you've got that ability to have extra extra wall engines not too bad eventually where it's falling down interrupt your gear main alloy problem for a long time but when it's used by pilots who know what to do with it it is formidable. And the thing that I, I checked with Matt, and then he blew my mind with, it was never deployed in squadron strength. So it was always in composite units. So whereas we look at things like the Pup, the Camel that come later, the, uh, the, the D-89, they're coming en masse. The Scout was never deployed in the sort of numbers that's that was expected it was always part of other units and i think that makes it makes it interestingly but for what it was yeah you know, considering it's got unsynchronized lewis guns firing through the the prop disc it doesn't have a wiping great vickers on it till quite later it leads the way and it buys a decent amount of time for the rfc and the rnas to bring the other types on then you look at it in a, in a naval context isn't it the first first aircraft to operate from a, a ship as well it, what it ushers in as well, because it's quite small and it's quite light, it's able to do that, but with decent power. I think it's it's underrated, maybe not for its combat record, just because it was missed, don't want to say misdeployed, but not utilized in the way that the later fighters were. But for them, what it heralds in naval aviation, I think it's it, it's really quite something. Strong defense. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's strong defense there. I was going to say for 
World War One B two C. Okay. But um, I, I I prefer your argument on that. I but yeah. I I was looking at the Royal Aircraft Factory ones. Oh yeah, Jeffrey de Havilland design as well. B two C is pretty fab as well, yeah. but. I think that I think that's a very strong defense. It's very hard to hard to argue with. Well, thank you. I did try. <laughs> oh, I, 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 you know, a couple of people I spoke to. I think I spoke to Edward Ward, Thomas Newdick, uh, Bing, uh, mm-hmm. and a few others. And quite a few people said all Italian aircraft from World War Two. <laughs> <laughs> we did top ten Italian aircraft from World War Two on the Hushkit site recently. And you're like, wow, they did have loads of really great stuff that's really overlooked. I mean, do we believe Finnish claims? Let's say that we do believe them. If we do believe them, that Fiat G50 has the highest kill-loss ratio of anything in World War II, I think. It's got like 33 to 1 kill-loss ratios against the Soviets. Wow. Crazy, right? 33 to 1. Like I thought before the best was the Buffalo was the had the best ratio and that again was Finnish but I don't know how much of that is that the Finns were really brave and kick-ass and how much of that is that they were quite relaxed with their claim system I don't know Finnish people Finnish historians will know the answer to that I don't know the answer to that they're pretty laid back the, the Finns yeah because you've got the Makitura too as well which is gorgeous oh be- beautiful yeah. loads of beautiful great planes and you know what's is it the 2005 that was considered the best axis piston engined i'm getting might be getting my designations wrong but one of the long nosed italians was considered the best mm. piston engine access aircraft by the german assessors so that's that's pretty good i should talk about the hashkit book of warplanes i realize i keep i've forgotten to do that once we finished talking about planes i was going to ask you about oh, cool. the latest okay, cool. on, on, just, on the book I so the, why, don't, why don't we do that now before we go down a, an italian aircraft rabbit hole and start talking about how if the italians knew how to make aero engines they would have been a real force <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole debate in itself there yes but anyways joe the book volume one how's how's it coming what's the latest how can people how can people support it and well the hush kit, stuff. hush kit book of warplanes so the hush kit site is totally free online thing where I've been writing top tens with some of the best writers, interviewing pilots, the most exciting planes, looking at really weird, obscure subjects in aviation and done tons of it. And there's like over a thousand articles or something. And so we decided to put that in a beautiful coffee table book a few years back. And we're doing it with Unbound where it's crowd funded. So that means it can be totally undiluted. And so volume one is funded and is going well, but volume two is only up to 23% funded. So I really want that to happen because, yeah, we've got some amazing stuff to go into that. So if people want to support the Hushkit Book of Warplanes Volume 2, and I think they should, <laughs> then they should <laughs> go to the Unbound website, uh, um, Unbound Publishers, uh, and look at it there. There's loads of links from the Hushkit site as well. We'll, we'll put and the links in the description to this as well. Pledge your pre-order. You get your name printed in the book. It's a beautiful big coffee table book it's good price for what it is and uh, it's got some really fabulous rare stuff in it and uh, artworks of airplanes that some of them i'm not even sure there's ever been artworks of before and interviews with foxback pilots blackbird pilots all sorts of things they even managed to get hold of a cold war su-15 pilot vigans so it's they're great books and they need people to pre-order volume two to make it happen so i would encourage people to do that well, I'm one of your volume one supporters, so Thank I shall have to pull, pull, pull my finger out and get volume two sorted as well. I I will do, I will, I, I'm on it. I'm on it. And th- yeah, thanks. Thanks for your support on that. That's all right. And, and also you, you did, you did, you did promise me a, a typhoon cover on volume two. If I, if I, support I you. promised you your own printed slip cover <laughs> <laughs> because we, we, uh, we, I did a talk at the, the war fest, the Al Murray James Holland history festival. And I was going to put a copy of the book picture up, the a picture of the book on the big screen there, but it's got a phantom on it. So you can't do that at a World War II festival. <laughs> so we specially mocked up a one typhoon one. Oh, does that affect your bingo score? And one um, whirlwind, mm-hmm. especially for that. And I think you you quite liked the, was it the typhoon cover you liked, the whirlwind cover you liked? Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to think, is it Des Scott leaning against the, 
the, the radiator on the one. So your yeah, your copy, yeah. and I can't promise this to any anyone else, so I hope no one else wants this, is gonna have a bespoke printed dust sleeve. Ah, perfect. Of a there we go. One. He says typing unbound.com into his into his browser as we speak. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. I'm a big fan of, of the site and oh. envious of of the output because it constantly seems to be something new on it and it's quite bananas how much time time we put into it it's a lot of coffee involved and lots of procrastinating on um other life things in order to do it but also just i'm just obsessed with military aircraft and air well airplanes in general and it's i find it so fun being able to have all these questions answered that i'm curious about myself and ask silly questions as well i ask a, a pilot who's flown spitfires and eurofighter typhoons how they would, what would happen if they dogfight fought each other. So, mm. you know, going very technical and going very silly and all that stuff. It's been fun. It's been fun doing it, but it is a mad, mad load of work. We are going to put links to both the books in the description for here and when this goes out as well. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so That's much for spending the evening with me. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I will forgive you on the whole Hercules debacle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I purposely was like, <laughs> got, to, got to throw something in here that's gonna be fun and i just love that we should we should talk about it more even though apparently it's like the most famous and most talked about aircraft <laughs> in the world definitely <laughs> so, so many so many interesting subjects in there so it's good stuff in there fantastic thank you so much my pleasure <laughs>